my wife and I, my wife Phil and I have been studying this place in southern Alberta since 1980. It's sort of archaeology, which is a long way away from chemical physics, but my studies in chemistry and physics for the past 60 years have been with complex systems. I think that mathematics and physics are a little bit too straightforward and they're far less interesting than chemistry. That's why I'm a chemist. But actually, you can penetrate more deeply into physics than into chemistry, get closer to fundamental nature, and that's why I'm doing physics as well as chemistry. Well, how did I get into archaeology? It's a complex system, but I grew up in Saskatchewan. In the 1930s, I was, well, I was born in 1930, so when I was sort of like four to five to maybe eight or nine years old, uh, we lived in a place on the prairie. It was dry, it was a period of drought, and the dry winds were blowing away the tilled soil. And my father was interested in Indian artifacts, stone tools, arrowheads. So on Sunday afternoons, some summers, we would, he would take the family out in the country to find a, a blowout where stones were left uh, resting on the clay heart pan. He would give the, the kids, there were three boys in that time, uh, five cents for each stone tool we found, whether an arrowhead or a knife or a Scraper. Five cents in 1930 was a pot of money. You could buy five eggs for them. So anyway, that's how I get interested in, in Indian artifacts. And when my father died many years later, the three boys split his collection of stones. Our sister didn't want any of it, so I got I inherited a third of his collection. And we drew straws for who gets the first choice. <laughs> I got the long straw, and the first choice was a frame that he had put his best arrowheads in. Some of them, I mean, there was no archaeology on the plains in the 1930s, but by the time of this 1960s and 70s, there was plains archaeologists, and there were some of them right here at the University of Alberta. And uh, so I started to wonder about some of these things, and I pestered geologists to find out about the stones, archaeologists to find out about the, what kind of tools, and how old were they, and so on. Well, I tend to be persistent, and so I, I soon ran out of need for a geological consultation, but I was pestering archaeologists uh, beyond their, temp their patience. And so, one of the archaeologists finally said, this would be 1977 or 8, Gord, do you know Jim McGregor? No. Well, Jim McGregor was a retired electrical engineer who, before he died, published 18 books of Western history. So, amateurs can sometimes do some stuff that's pretty fun. Anyway, they said that Jim McGregor he and his wife walked across along the Saskatchewan River, almost across Alberta, for 15 years, and they have a fantastic collection of stone tools. So the archaeologist got rid of me by passing me on to Jim McGregor, and so I visited Jim and his wife, and they have this fantastic collection of tools, and so I made lots of visits to the McGregors. And I guess I ran past their patients because one time Jim said, Gord, I know a bunch of places in southern Alberta where you and Phil would really love to see the things. So <laughs> he drew me a map in southern and eastern Alberta, a long way away from Edmonton, with 15 carved rocks, they call them ribstones, they're not ribstones, but anyway, and teepee rings and medicine wheels and hoped that we would go away and see these things. <laughs> so Phil and I drove 4,500 
kilometers in eight days. We visited all of his 15 sites. We asked him to act asking directions of farmers along the way. They showed us two more that weren't on the list. So we photographed these things. All of the things that Jim had told us about seemed to be more or less what he said. But this one site where there was a medicine wheel on the top of a hill, as Phil and I were walking up the side of the hill, we saw other patterns of stones along the side, big stones. And so, this was in August 1980, and I thought so much of those patterns so long, <laughs> along uh, going up the hill that I don't have any photograph from 1980 of the actual medicine wheel on the top. All of the photographs are up from a stone configuration down the side up toward this mound of stones, the sun carrying I call it now. Uh, at the top of the hill. So I brought these photographs back and showed them to archaeologists and asked what these patterns down the side of the hill mean. And they said, every stone except those in the medicine wheel is exactly where it was left when the glacier melted back 10,000 years ago. And a couple of archaeologists at the University of Calgary I asked them the same, and they said the same thing. And I thought, well, these patterns are, are very interesting. Mama Nature makes interesting patterns, but there's too much human intent, I think, in these things. So we started to study. And this is 2016. We're still studying the same thing. We can't find an end to this darn thing. So. I got launched into archaeology from my father. As we made more and more discoveries, rather than we stumbled on this actual calendar, in a way that I won't take the time to tell you, but we found a solar calendar of extreme accuracy, so accurate that it's changed the definition of equinox in the Oxford English Dictionary, in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and eventually it will change the definition of equinox in every European language. Because equinox is defined in a Christian way now, so that Christians can celebrate Easter, which is tied to the spring equinox, on the same day north and south of the equator. It turns out that the real equinox, which means equal night, equinoctium, is latitude dependent. So if they, if they kept the old time definition of the date of Easter, they would have to have a month difference between Easter celebrations and the north and south of the equator. But Jesus resurrected only once, so Pope Gregory the, the 13th decided we won't pick it on the equal day night, we will pick it when the sun is above the equator. Now you've fixed the latitude, so you fix the date. The trouble is, on the equator, there is never an equal day and night. Never. The day, because of refraction of the sunlight coming into the atmosphere at a low angle, is bent down. On the equator, the day is always seven minutes longer than the night. And on the Gregorian equinox at the latitude of Edmonton or of Stonehenge, the, the daylight from first flash to last flash is 12 hours and 10 minutes long, and the night from last to first flash is 11 hours and 50 minutes long, not equal. Well, when we discovered the calendar here, I heard about arguments going on about whether Stonehenge in England has a calendar in it. And I read all the papers and all the books about the argument in England. This is a lot of reading. But anyway, it turns out that about 300 years ago, somebody had decided that the axis of the circle and the trilithon horseshoe in, in uh, Stonehenge the axis of that lines up with the summer solstice sunrise. 
and people didn't talk about it much during the next few centuries, but by 1900, people had thought that, well, the winter solstice sunset sets opposite the summer solstice sunrise, so this axis lines up both with the summer sunrise and the winter sunset. Well, that was about 1900 up until World War One, and then you had World War One and World War Two. People didn't have time for this kind of nonsense. So, in 1965, an American astronomer published a book uh, where he just looked, used a map, a map of Stonehenge, drew the lines, measured the angles, and put it into his computer, and he discovered a whole calendar. And the Englishman, reading these American comments by a guy who doesn't even go there and do a measurement, is nonsense. So the Englishman decided in the 70s that there's no calendar in Stonehenge at all. And that's the situation that I ran into when I was reading about this stuff. There is no calendar there. But all of the observers, the guys who actually did attempt to interpret Stonehenge, they stood in the middle of Stonehenge Circle, they looked through the big gaps between the vertical stones, uh, of the 30 stones uh, in the Stonehenge Circle, 30 meter diameter, and uh, said, well, 4,000 years ago, they'd be lucky if they could measure an angle within one or two degrees. So it's got to be, if there's a crude calendar for the, the summer, uh, uh, sunrise and the winter sunset, uh, the line is probably just as good as one or two degrees. But the lines that Phil and I had found out here were accurate to a twentieth of a degree. So that means that these Englishmen were out by a factor of twenty to forty. So we decided to go over there and have a look at ourselves and use our, our own methods. It's got to have a long line with a narrow front and back sight. That means you can't stand in the middle of the circle and look out between the big gaps. You have to stand outside the circle and find a crack that goes right through the whole structure of the circle and the tridathons in the right direction to give you the sunrise or sunset. And in 1995, <laughs> after I was forced to retire, because in those days uh, you're not allowed to teach after you're 65, uh, so I had to retire in September uh, 1995, but that left me free to go to England in December. So Phil and I went to England. We began our Stonehenge studies in, in December 1995, and very quickly we found, we thought that well the line not only has to go through the cracks in, in, in the Stonehenge structure, there should be some marker about a kilometer away. Well, the winter saw we went in December, so we had to look for the winter rise and set. We had good luck. The winter sunset, standing at the, what they call the heel stone, it's a, I don't know, 30 ton, 20 ton stone, uh, about 50 meters out of the circle. You stand there and you look through a tiny crack through the circle and the trilithons, and the end point is the crease of a barrel. It's where a, a bow barrel uh, and the berm of the bow barrel meet. They make an angle, and that's where the sun went 4,000 years ago. And we tried to find the winter solstice sunrise, but it was all cloudy, and we didn't do that. Anyway, we in subsequent years, and the last time we went there for a study to do photography and stuff was 2010, and. Uh, they have exactly the same calendar as over here. So I tried, I tried through the decades to publish scientific articles in archaeology journals in Canada, United States, and Britain. I sent many, many articles off. All of them were rejected. And so I decided that, well, I'll just write a popular book and get a general publisher to, to publish it. Uh, and eventually the scientists, when the young ones grow up, will maybe read this stuff. And I had trouble finding a publisher. So I found this 
the lady in Calgary who at least listened, and she said, what's the story of your book in one sentence? I said, genius existed on the prairies 5,000 years ago. So, so that's how Canada's Stonehenge was created. I made up titles that said what's really in the book. And she said, you've killed your book. And the <laughs> nerdy title just won't stand. It won't sell any books. So she made up this thing. Canada, our temple, temple is the key to understanding Stonehenge. So it, it's not too bad a title. I don't like it, but it seems to sell the books. Well, this is published in Canada. It turns out that publishing industry is, is closed. If you publish it in Canada, you cannot sell it in Canada, in the United States or Britain. Well, Stonehenge is in Britain. I want it sold in Britain. Well, then you have to publish it in Britain. So, three years later, I published that book, which is the first 80% of this, and then I added 20% of new stuff make this larger and correct a, a half a dozen small errors in this one, like typos or the wrong person's name or something like that. Uh, I, I call a Steve Fred, as that had to be corrected. Anyway, my same kind of nerdy titles put off this publisher in, in Britain, and so he made this one up. Hidden Stonehenge. He didn't want Canada. Who ever heard of Canada anyway? If you're talking about Stonehenge, just say, Hidden Stonehenge, ancient temple in North America reveals the key to ancient wonders. Well, it doesn't turn me on, but uh, anyway, that's what he wanted. I'm still writing about this stuff. Phil and I are writing a seven-volume book about it, because this contains only a tiny fraction of what we know about the Sun Temple. And what we've discovered in the past 36 years at the Sun Temple in Alberta is just enormous. So I started to write a detailed description of it. Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. It's got to be now 7, and I think I'm just going to quit after 7 with an index and so on, because I'm getting old. Anyway, the first four volumes, this title is Temple of the Sun, Moon, and Morning Star, but I need to, because it will be available to non-Albertans. Near Majorville, Alberta will be added in the last three volumes. But the first four volumes, which uh, were completed a couple of years ago, uh, there are only five sets of them on archival paper, archival ink, and so on. And so they should be available under conditions where nobody can walk off with them. And so the first four volumes are in the Rare Books Library at the University of Alberta, in the Glenbow Library in Calgary, Glenbow Museum Library, where nobody can sign out of them, and also in the Library of the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa Gatineau. I have nearly completed volumes five and six, and so there is a little more than one volume still to go. It will take maybe one or two years. But the difficulty is I make about one new discovery every month. I have so I have 13,000 photographs. I have aerial survey of very, very fine detail. And so when I'm looking for information about something I photographed on the ground in my aerial survey, I had an aerial survey done for six and a half square miles of this stuff, I always find something else that I didn't know about. So I will write as much as I can until I run out of energy and then it'll be up to somebody else to carry on the study. <laughs>